Okay, I've got some, um, I've taken some notes, so I'm going to cue first to 134. When it's appropriate to interrogate a specific use of a language, and when it's not. When it's appropriate to interrogate a specific use of a language, and when it's not. It is always appropriate, in my opinion, to interrogate language. Language is by... Uh, it's nature superficial, the mysticism to the contrary notwithstanding, right? We know that these words are, uh, they're not even gestalts, but they're singular little pseudo-atomic uh, tokens that relate to these complex frames of interrelated ideas. So we know that the ideas are always below the surface of the word, so it's always important to interrogate a language, and specifically um, grammar. How you decide that basically is related to the degree to which you're attentive to what's actually going on, like what's actually happening. Because there are words in our language that attempt to articulate something that we were experiencing unceasingly on a continuous basis before we came up with a word for it. I think you go into consciousness um, uh, and its ever-present nature, but it, I think that was a different quote. Okay, um, no comment, that's just a bit from you. And 323. So if you're using like maybe an Aquas Razor principle, like that that person thinks that there's actually a being that's non-existent, but that that person is able to envision or think about the future, like ever. Look, that's the issue. That's why I'm interrogating language, okay? Um, I am picking on the idea of a non-existent being. We have arguments that come, the non-existent being can't feel suffering, therefore, therefore, therefore. But it's obvious. Being means to exist. Non-existent being is just the epitome of an oxymoron, right? So, and in terms of logic, it's a and not a. So, anything you can conclude from that is subject to the fact that it started from an inherent contradiction. Now, that's not just in interrogating language. People are making logical deductions of, based on the concerns of this non-existent being. The asymmetry comes from the fact that you've accepted the beingness of something that's non-being. And you say, well, but people are just using it to, yeah, well, they could speak more carefully, right, and speak about what they're actually mean to be speaking about, because non-existent being is, you're talking about, well, it's just them getting a handle on the future. Well, they should talk about time. They, they shouldn't try to invent a way to talk about time that ignores time. You will become a being, so you're a being. You're not a being yet, so you're non-existent. Now you're a non-existent being. No, that, that doesn't take time into account. So you have to take time into account. You have to say it's an interval from which uh, existent matter, um, uh, like, invokes a consciousness that was non-existent prior. Somewhere in the period, in the interval, you can go and say, well, at this point it definitely wasn't conscious, and at this point it definitely was. You know, and it might be hard to put those exact points, but, you know, in rough macroscope language, you, you can do it, right? It's not uh, too impossible. It's like when it was an ovum, it wasn't conscious. It was part of the mother, mother's body. It did not have its own consciousness. It was not, it was individual as a cell, so we could trace the material history, but it wasn't, indiv it wasn't individual as its own entity of even, even living like a single cell, which is kind of dormant, right? But we know where the material was. And to analyze this, we can't just ignore time and go, well, it's a being and it's non-existent and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's dead and alive. It's everything it's ever going to be in one moment. We'll use a word for that. No. We have to realize the segment. And when we're figuring out social and moral questions, you have to look at the details. At one point, it's a part of the mother's body. So we have a principle that a person gets to make their own medical decisions. So that means that at one point the mother makes its medical decisions, its life and death decisions, whether it has heart surgery or not. Okay. Later on, when it's independent, 
it's respected as its own agent with its own decision making power and that power is vested it's not just potential not just in principle but it's vested you know based on whether that person is mentally handicapped or truly actually can demonstrate competency to a certain degree benefit of the doubt going to them and that's what it is it's a progress you cannot say make you cannot say you cannot use its eventual beingness as an argument when it's still a part of the mother's body as a way to tell the mother what she should do with her body see this isn't just a matter of people can do wrong things and have the right no the mother actually is the one the only one that can say and decide what the right situation is for things that are her body now when it is no longer a part of her body then it is the thing and those are necessarily separated in time to interrogate the words the word of uh, the use of the word non-existent being as if it were an oxymoron and therefore the logic were in, uh, uh, inherently intrinsically flawed then you would have to be interrogating the language in a way that doesn't make sense because a word like existence is articulating something that has always been there so you you cannot know you cannot not know what we mean by that because but look it's something that's always been there yes so there really it never was non-existent either the consciousness could be called you know not existent isn't even the right word because consciousness is a a property of behavioral it's it's this thing is behaving consciously right so you know it's not a thing that exists or not it's a quality that is evident or not or decomposable or not right but um you know i i i, I can do well let me listen to that again i'll start that over to interrogate the words the word of uh, the use of the word non-existent being as if it were an oxymoron and therefore the logic were in, uh, uh, inherently intrinsically flawed then you would have to be interrogating the language in a way that doesn't make sense because a word like existence is articulating something that has always been there so you you cannot know you cannot not know what we mean by that because you've always experienced it so it's very easy to understand the inverse uh, I like what you're getting at but I don't know it's like people didn't necessarily know that there was oxygen and air but they felt wind but they thought wind was the thing and then you know it's not always just because some when something is ever present it can be harder to quote unquote notice consciously but of course you find out later when you do notice it consciously that you were taking it into account all the time you just were so used to it you know you were acclimated to it but I um uh, but I think that, yeah, I think you need to work on that particular particular argument. I mean, um, yeah, I know what we mean by being, but I just think that time is not, it's like, it's like the idea, the old idea that a line is made of an infinite number of points. It's not. There's an infinite number of points that are on a line, but the line itself is made up of little tiny line segments, right, or a formula or something. It's made up of something that has extent. Right. So we need to give extent to our things. There are points and times there's little intervals. You know, there's intervals here, and it's actually a really long one between when we would say that the consciousness of, of the ovum doesn't exist to the ovum growing into something that does have a consciousness. You have to focus on what's actually happening. And that doesn't involve just what's happening within the walls of your house. I mean, it's obvious. I'm, I just feel like some of, some people that are uh, so in a, so so in opposition to these these ideas. I, I I agree with focusing on the house. I mean, I one of the problems with antinatalism is that people are trying to say you have to look at what's going on in the world. I have. I mean, I I know about the situation of the worker, the, the history of the genocides, the history of. Of, of all of this stuff, I've traced a lot of the thinking to this objectivist type thinking, and I'm not the only one, and I'm very, very focused on it, and when people, when you're focused on something and other people go, well, you just won't look at it, I mean, what? 
they're in denial. I am looking at it. They, <clears throat> not you so much, but some of these people with whom I end up having a more frustrated or frustrating interchange, you know, they need to look at it more clearly and see how I can come down where I come down. You know, like, for example, part of it is, as I said before, um, and I give people these fodder things that they could hold on to. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it's honestly how I could see criticizing my position. Um, but that um, there's a certain amount of bravado and bravery of like, I'm going to try this and see if it works. But the odds are against you. All the more interesting. I am going, you know, you cannot overcome that type of an individual decision right that I've decided I will risk it it is worth it you can't overrule that judge you can have your own position but a position that everybody should do a particular thing it's not just that they have the right to do something else that'll be wrong it's that they have a right to decide what's right in certain areas and people boo boo or Gary are gonna come along and go, well I guess if I wanna eat your liver um, no, I don't even need to go into that more. We're not talking about things like that. We're talking about continuing your own life, living in the valley versus the mountain, having a child or not. All right. You could limit. I used to be against this, but I can understand that limiting, that there's a social impact to kids. You could limit kids, but I don't see how you can limit it below steady state population two kids per woman. Pictures.